Hello everyone, Dr. Hassan Doid here with an amazing guest, your favorite and my favorite, Dr. Malke Assad, who has just shown and proven with his, with his actions that anything is possible. He just mashed into plastic surgery, one of the most competitive residency um, programs or specialty, you can say. And uh, let's let's begin and let's talk to Dr. Malki Assad. Hello, Dr. Malki Assad. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you so for, uh, for having me here. It's a pleasure to be on your channel. You are welcome. And uh, I really appreciate and I thank you for having time uh, for us and for our students and uh, for the listeners and viewers. Thank you. Of course, happy to help. So uh, first of all, congratulations on matching into plastic surgery. Dream come true. It's a dream come true. That's amazing, you know, and uh, a usual perception. A yeah, usual it, was, it, was, it was difficult. As you know, it's not uh, the perception of an IMG getting into plastic surgery is not something uh, as foreign graduates we're used to. So it was not only a challenge in the process itself, but also going against everything that we know about the match process and what is possible and what is impossible. Sure, sure, absolutely. I can totally understand because initially the perception was that IMGs uh, cannot go into plastic surgery. It's extremely competitive. Yeah, so I have some questions. I have some questions that the students would like to know. Uh, first of all, the question is, can IMGs match into competitive specialties just like you have done? How do you see it? The answer is definitely yes. I'm not saying it's easy or anyone can match, but definitely yes. Every year IMGs have proven that it is possible to match not only in, in, com in competitive specialties, but as you mentioned in the beginning in very competitive programs. So my program is one of the top three programs in plastic surgery in the nation. So it's not only just a regular program in plastic surgery, but IMGs are matching into top programs. I interviewed on my channel, also IMGs who match at Harvard, at Hopkins, at Mayo Clinic. So you'll see that IMGs every year are matching not only in competitive specialties, but in competitive residency programs. The answer that it is possible to match into competitive specialties, but I'm not gonna say it's easy and everyone will match. Because this year around 80 applicants applied for plastic surgery, around 80, and five or six IMGs made it to, to match into programs. So it is possible, but as you see, it's a small percentage because it's a very competitive process. Even American graduates are applying and not matching. This year, around 360 applied to plastic surgery and only 180 spots. So you can imagine there were so many American graduates who were not able to match into plastic surgery. So you will see, we'll talk about what is the recipe of matching, but the answer is only to match in a program. IMGs are matching into the top programs in the country. On my channel, I've interviewed IMGs who matched at Harvard, at uh, Mayo Clinic. I know IMGs who matched at Hopkins. My program is one of the top three in plastic surgery in the uh, competitive specialties, but also competitive programs. But it's not easy, and there are so many things that go into whether someone will match it or not. Perfect, perfect. So that means that it, uh, luck also does play a huge role. And do you recommend that IMG should have a backup plan as well? Definitely luck play a role, uh, although the huge role is how much you'll work. And we'll talk about the factors that play a in, role into matching. But at the end of the day, yes, luck, luck play into role. Not only a role in the match itself, but also luck in working with the right people in the right place at the right time. My second question is, uh, the second question is, of course, to match into a competitive field, you are going to prove that you have your uh, CV better than many AMGs, American graduates. So what do you recommend? What should IMGs do to make sure that they, they are seen as better candidates in comparison to even American graduates? Yes, so that is the, the $100,000 question. What should I do to match or what makes me stand out? And there are so many factors that go into it. Because your application is not only scores, it's not only research, it's not only clinical rotation. It's a combination of so many things. And let's start with scores. These are the most obvious thing on your CV and the thing that you usually start with. 
So try to get as high score as you can. You don't need to get to 70s and to 60s to match into competitive specialties. I think most of the those who I know who match into plastic surgery did not have either like 260s or 270s. Most of them were 230s, 240s, and 250s. So scores are important. They give you an extra advantage. They help you a lot if you have a higher score, but not having the super high score will not prevent you from matching into plastic surgery. So again, in summary for scores, try to get 240s, 250s and above. But if you didn't get 260s and 270s, it's not at the end of the day. Most of the people I know who match into plastic surgery as IMGs did not have 260s and 270s. The oh. other thing is clinical rotations. If you're able to secure an elective in which you have hands-on clinical experience, you interact with US physicians, you work with residents, with fellows in institutions that have residency program. This is the mistake that I see so many IMGs do. They go and look for, for a rotation and probably sometimes it's in a private clinic, sometimes it's in a community hospital that they don't have a residency program. Not having the residency program affect whether people who are in the residency field know you. If, if, you, if they like you, they can keep you in the same program. You lose all that if you're doing it in a private clinic. Even the value of the letter of recommendation is much less if it's coming from somebody they don't know versus some, some big institutions they trust. So try to do it in an institution that is recognizable, uh, work with a mentor who is recognizable during your, your rotation and definitely elective versus the observership. For those who are not very familiar, elective, you work as a US medical student. You scrub in, in surgeries, you examine patients, you write notes versus observership where you're just observing. So try to secure electives. Again, I've seen some applicants who match without electives. So it's not only one factor, it's so many factors. The third one, which is uh, historically speaking, it's been shown to be the most important one so far is research. And the reason why research is becoming more and more important is twofold. The first one is the number of publications, the research experience that you're getting during your research time. And number two, the connections that you're establishing during these years. For example, me, I worked with the chair of MD Anderson for two years across the country, knows him. So when he writes me a letter of recommendation, that letter has so much value because this, this comes from someone they know and they trust. So try to work with someone who is recognizable in the field, who, who can help you uh, build your network and can give you the research skills and research ideas and research projects that you can work on. So that's why research is important. And you see now IMGs are spending two to three years of research. I think this, it varies. Some uh, do it after a year, but I don't think for competitive specialties like plastic surgery or neurosurgery, it's going to work after one year. So you see most of them doing two to three years, sometimes four. And uh, finally, it's the CV, the personal statement, volunteering, extra work experiences, the, the interview skills. You see some applicants, they think that it's only about check boxes and they go to the interview, they get 10, 15 interviews and they don't match and they wonder why didn't we match. Sometimes it's luck, sometimes it's interview skills. You are not able to show them who you are as a person during the interview. That's why having good interview skills, training with someone who's experienced can go a long way. Some people might be surprised that Two things I never imagined that they would be brought up during my interviews. Uh, one is my YouTube channel was brought up in every single interview. And second, the background. These background people were asking, what is this thing behind you? What is this plant real? So they want to get to know you. So use opportunities like this to tell people stories about you. and uh, Something unique about yourself, sport, music, or YouTube channel that can help you stand out from other applicants. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, actually, you know, I mentioned that to my students that uh, everyone has scores now, everyone has US clinical experience. Why can't you just write your, write your own blog or maybe YouTube channel? And uh, because residency directors see like hundreds of candidates, how will they remember you? Let's say, let's say you tell that, oh, I have a YouTube channel. You are already in the top, top 10%. Now, uh, if the scores are not good, let's say somebody had a bad day on the exam day. Now he has bad score and he wanted to be in plastic surgery. Let's say scores less than 230, less than 220. Is it still possible to match? It is still possible, but the chance is very, very low. However, I've seen people who made it. So it is possible. Generally, it's possible in the institution where you do your research. So to answer the question of what do I need to do if I have 220s on my step exams and I want to match into plastic surgery, 
The answer is research. There is nothing other than research that can help you in this situation. So, okay. So uh, that's what I actually tell my students. And uh, I'm glad that you agree with that. That let's say somebody has bad scores. So with the number of publications, you can very much undo the damage. I mean, you cannot 100% uh, undo the damage, but in terms of the weakness on your CV, if the number of publications keep increasing, you are adding some numbers to gauge and to help the residency directors decide that if you are a worthy candidate. That is definitely true, but you have to be careful also about the quality of publications. Because some people, I have known some who have who has 100 or 150 publications that were all in low impact journals, uh, case reports, or publications that are not very valuable to the field. So when you apply to residency programs, especially when you're talking about research, you're, we're talking about top institutions that care about research in the first place. So they, they know what a good paper is and what the balance between quantity and quality. But if you have good quality with number of citations, good journals, yes, it would balance. Probably like a systematic review, meta-analysis, clinical trial. Yes, clinical trials would be the best. <laughs> yeah. Okay, perfect, perfect. Now, uh, next question is, nowadays remote US clinical experience is very common, especially after pandemic, after this COVID-19. So many IMGs are going towards these opportunities while sitting in their home countries and getting US clinical experience remotely. What do you, what do you say about it? So I have uh, mixed feelings about, about the remote experience. And we actually wrote a paper, me and two of my colleagues, we wrote a paper in the Journal of Surgical Research about my experience and their experience from their away rotations, virtual, virtual away rotations. And the reason why I have mixed feelings is that if you ask me, what do you think of these? I'm not a very uh, good fan of virtual rotations because you don't get to know the people well over Zoom. You don't get to establish these connections. If you're doing surgery, how can you operate if you're doing surgery? How can you show them your skills of examining patients, taking notes, functioning in the, in the team? It's totally different setting. Maybe you can do some clinic visits, but this is not how residency works. Even internal medicine, the, the tough part about IM is being in the hospital inpatient, not the outpatient setting. So that's why I don't see it reflecting what actually needs to be be assessed during a rotation, which is you're hard against virtual rotations if you had the opportunity to do in person. If you have no other options, well, you know, this is what, what is available. It's better than nothing. The other pause, the positive thing I find about virtual rotation is that I, the program I met in, I did the virtual rotation in. I was planning to do an in person rotation. And when COVID happened, they said we're doing virtual rotations. And I applied and I had a, the opportunity to give grand rounds in front of the whole department, talk to every single faculty. So it helped me. I think it helped me match in my program. It definitely did not help me in other programs. So this is the advantage, disadvantage of virtual rotation. I don't think it will help you match at other programs. So for example, if you did it program A, program B would look at the application and see virtual rotation. They wouldn't care about virtual rotation. I don't think they value virtual rotation. But program A, since they, now they know you, they've talked to you, they know that you spent time to spend it with them. I think that is valuable. So going back on the idea of rotations, do it in the program you're interested in and they have a residency program. If you're doing it in a private clinic, it's not going to help you much because I don't think where you'll know the people and these people will choose you afterwards. Here it becomes more valuable. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. And you already answered this question, how important research publications are. Uh, that's, that was supposed to be my next question, but that's uh, wonderful. You already answered. But my question is, do you think now everyone should have some publications when they apply for the match? It depends on the specialty. For, for if, I, if there are IMGs applying for a competitive specialty, I don't see them matching without research. It happened in very, very rare instances, but I don't see IMGs matching into competitive specialties without research. The other type of specialties such as pediatrics, uh, pathology, IM, yeah, most IMGs who might don't have publications or they have a case report that I'm not sure if we should count that as research in the first place. So no, not everyone should have research. My opinion about research is that everybody should have the knowledge about research because if you want to be a good clinician, you have to have 
a good knowledge about research. Even if you're not interested in doing research in, in the future, I believe it's, it should be a must. Every applicant or every resident should have the knowledge because when you go and graduate and read a paper about treatment of pneumonia and there is no treatment, you want to know whether this is a good paper or not. So I don't think everybody should have papers, but at least everybody should have the knowledge to do research and be able to interpret papers. Okay, perfect. Now, thank you for your time and I will save your time. I don't want to waste a lot of time. I'll come to the last question and a very important question. Um, I have seen that you have some courses for IMGs and I'm sure that our listeners and viewers would like to know about your courses. What exact courses are you offering? And then how can they enroll? Definitely. So I have uh, the first course I started it was kind of an experiment doing a step three course. So I did the three exams, especially the CCS part, because the CCS part is different than, than what we've been used to in step one and step two CK. And currently there are feedback you get from you world or from the other platforms, but nobody can show you how you can do it. And this is what's make it unique about the, the CCS cases. So I did a YouTube video, a long YouTube video about how to navigate the CCS and the course. And recently, this is the one I've been enjoying the most is the research course. So I did a course to navigate the publication process from the level of idea. So let's say your mentor gave you an idea and told you, take this and make it a paper. And I'm not talking about case reports here. I'm talking about real research studies. So I went into the details of how you can take the paper from the idea, how to evaluate research idea, do the literature search, build the variable list, identify definitions, how to collect the data, and then write the paper each lesson for, for, the, for the writing is like one and a half hour to two hours. So the overall course is around 14 hours and it will be done in mid-June. So I did the live version. Now I'm, I'm, I finished recording the sessions. I'm editing them. I will add so many quizzes, assignments. So it will be ready in mid-June and I can provide the link. So the viewers, if they're interested, they can sign up. And currently I'm working on another course to supplement the first one for statistical analysis. So give... Uh, young medical students who are interested in research and they have no idea about research. This is not for advanced researchers. This is for beginners who have no idea about research so they can do the publication process and they can do statistical analysis. Okay, perfect. So uh, the thing is that regarding the, the CS uh, uh, course, um, oh, how, how, how many years ago did you prepare that? Or how many months ago? How, when did you start? I, uh, it's been, it's been around two months now. It's, it's also a new course. Okay. So it's been around for two months after I finished preparing my step three. So I did that course uh, and it, it's there. I, I'm recently, do, I'm, I'm doing now a, a YouTube video with you all. So I'll be host, uh, launching that hopefully next week. And we'll also, there is a free giveaway for you all subscription if, if the viewers are interested in that. Okay, perfect. You know, I will share the link uh, under this video for Malik, Malik Asad's uh, channel. Everyone, please subscribe to his channel. And regarding the courses, I have not seen too many people pre uh, preparing people for step three. So this course is going to be a game changer for you guys. So I think you guys should not hesitate. It's not a, uh, not a rocket science uh, to uh, to decide that whether you should go for it. I think you definitely should go for the course. And although we run our own research course, but I highly recommend Malki Asad's course because that teaches you from the basics to the end, from the idea to the publication, it will help you. And especially for those who are not interested in publications and they they just want to learn. And as, as Malki Asad said, everyone should, at least if you're not getting research experience, should get some courses so that you can actually show to the residency directors that you are not ignorant and you know something about research. Yes, I definitely agree. And for my courses, there's a, a refund within the one to two days. So if you don't like it, you can definitely ask me. I can offer you a full refund. And of course, try many courses. Try that, my course, the other courses, because the more ideas you can get, the better experience you have. You don't have to pick one and, and go for it. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. So I highly recommend uh, to the students that please enroll into uh, Malki Asad's courses and keep learning from him. He is such a blessing because people, when they become successful, many people, they try to hide the information, but he's the guy who is actually sharing every single thing without hiding a single point. He has told every secret that he knew to all of you to serve you. 
So um, just uh, learn from him. And it's a, it's a blessing to have you, Malki Asad, uh, for the students and to come to uh, this meeting and join us on our channel. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure talking to you.